do a round of introductions because we really want to maximize our time with you tonight. And uh, you have also agreed, graciously agreed, that we can use tonight's recording as a podcast for our Learning Aloud series at Penn. So all of you will be part of that opportunity to ask questions as we go. So we're going to be, we are now recording. Thank you, Wayne. I see you're doing that. It's great. Yeah. So this first hour oh. will be all about Daryl and his book. And uh, I'm going to get the conversation started. If you would like to ask Daryl a question, it would be helpful if you raise your hand on the uh, on the Zoom link so that we know that you're ready to ask a question and then you'll be invited in. It'll just make the podcast work so much more smoothly than me saying, anybody got any questions? And then there's a silence. So feel free to jump in at any time with a question. Raise your hand. We'll recognize you. And then we'll be able to bring you into that uh, conversation. And that goes for our guests too. Susan, Bianca, if you would like to do that as well, you're welcome to do so. Great to have it. All right. Welcome, Daryl. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for taking your time tonight to come and see. We've all been um, very much excited and looking forward to tonight because this book, uh, Doing Agile Right, with which you are a co-author, is very much part of our course material this year, and we're delighted to have found it. I, I wonder if we could start, though. Tell us a little bit. What is Agile in your mind? Well, in my mind, Agile is a lifestyle. <laughs> It's a lifestyle that accelerates learning and growing and makes it a natural part of the way we work and the way we live. I think it has a deep uh, focus on collaborating with customers and rapid feedback loops and small teams but mostly it's just a way of making uh, people happier and more successful, in my opinion. So I'm fascinated by the title of the book because it says Doing Agile Right, which presupposes that there's a wrong way of doing it. So <laughs> just to highlight for us the sort of the wrong way versus the right way and give us some highlights of each so that we can recognize when we're doing it wrong and perhaps when we're on the right track. Yes, we, we called it doing Agile right because we see it done wrong so frequently. And my biggest fear, frankly, is that it will be done wrong and it will turn into one more fad that ends up on the scrap heap of management manias. And that would be such a shame. I, I see people that are using heavily bureaucratic processes to try to create an agile organization. These huge program management offices that are the agile police to make sure that people are checking every box and doing every ceremony and filling every artifact exactly the way they should. And that's not agile that's just more bureaucracy trying to get people to do what you want them to do faster than before i see people using it as a euphemism for layoffs we're going to get rid of 30 to 40 percent of our people uh, let's just call that agile it'll, it'll be a whole lot less painful if we fire them and say it's due to agile um, we see people that create discord between agile teams and the rest of the organization. Uh, there's the cool kids that get to work in agile and then everybody else somehow gets demoted and they're just expected to do what they're told. Yeah, I, I could go on, but uh, sadly there are way too many people that are misusing agile. So when it is being done right, what are the hallmarks of that being done right? I would say there are, I've got a list of 10 actually. If we get around to showing some slides, I'd be happy to run through a few of those. I would probably point to three in particular. One is that people use Agile to become Agile. That is, we're going to test, we're going to learn, we're going to change a lot of things along the way. We may change our strategy, we may change our organization structure, we may change our culture, we may change our business processes, 
but we're going to test and learn our way into changing those as we find a constraint and improve the ability to work through that. The second thing I would say is you have to move from being a boss centric organization to being a customer centric organization. And honestly, I can smell within a day whether a company is boss centric or customer centric. And when people are just trying to please the boss and don't feel like they have the opportunity to say, that's an interesting idea. I wonder how we could test it with customers. If they're not able to at least raise that issue, that's a problem. And then the third thing I'd say is companies that are doing it right, they're having fun. Uh, they are delivering better results. They are feeling like they're learning, like they're growing, like they're more fulfilled, like they're contributing more. And it's not at all unusual for me to be in a training session uh, with people who have been working on agile teams for a month or two months and have them say, I'm never going back to the old way of working. If I have to leave the company to find someone else that'll let me keep working this way, I'll do it. But they really are more productive, happier, more successful. It's just a, a more natural way of working, I think. Great. So we have a couple of questions. I'm going to go to Juliet first. Uh, Juliet, to unmute and ask you a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a question about um, some of the leaders of innovation that are often um, said to be, you know, the best at it in a lot of innovation books like Google, um, who are often kind of held up as an example of doing Agile right. What do you see, if anything, as um, some pointers for large software development companies in the way that they potentially could be doing Agile wrong? So I'll say a couple of things. One is don't believe everything you read <laughs> because, you know, right now I am working with three very large, very successful companies that all have more than 2,000 Agile teams up and running. Mm. 2,000. And what they say is, Daryl, yeah, we could stand up 100 Agile teams overnight. That's not, that's not a question. Uh, the real issue is how do we surround those teams with an operating model that helps them to succeed? That's the challenge. The challenge mm -hmm. is if they get blocked at every turn by a business system that won't let them operate as an Agile team, that's the problem. And so I think the people that are doing this right really do do two things. One is they know how to make agile teams work. But second of all, they know how to surround them with an operating model that gets the most out of them. And I was being a little facetious, but I do get to work with the companies that are some of the most successful and prestigious in the world. And I will say it's not all roses and rainbows at those companies either. They all have strengths and weaknesses. And it's not hard for a writer to use the halo effect to, you know, create a distribution curve of performance, pick the tail of top performers and then try to describe them as perfect entities. And almost never is that true. I often read those articles. I'm often working with the company and I just sort of smile and shake my head and said, if they ever really knew the truth about what they're working through, they're doing people a disservice because Agile as well has weaknesses. Yes, it has strengths, but we're always looking for balance. And if you go into Agile believing that it is the magic solution to every problem, good luck, because you're going to run into buzzsaws and you say, I never expected this. 
you know, just as a few simple examples in Agile, we like to talk about uh, delayering, about not having as many layers between the CEO and the front lines. There are a couple of things that are pretty interesting about that. One is if you have fewer layers, you also have fewer promotions. And so one reason that people have a bunch of layers in their organization is so that every six months or a year, you can, you can say, well, you're no longer a junior so-and-so, you're now a full so-and-so, and now you're a senior so-and-so, and people get accustomed to that. Furthermore, there's some evidence that even as you de-layer, sometimes that just increases senior level uh, micromanagement mm-hmm. over people. And so I'm just trying to point out that there are strengths and weaknesses to everything. And if you don't go into Agile understanding that it too has weaknesses, then I think you're likely to run into some problems you don't need to. Well, thanks for that. Rashid, you have a question. Sure. Um, for uh, reasons that are much uh, too long to explain today, I was exposed and learned a great deal about how uh, the engineering team at Chrysler in the mid to late 90s implemented what they called platform teams, which when you really think about it has pretty significant and strong similarities to ad- what Agile is known as today. Um, but then there was a pretty significant leadership turnover and uh, that approach um, and the successes that I think had come from that approach around sales and profitability also went away with that leadership. And they lost a significant portion of the workforce that had grown to really, I think, embrace and enjoy Agile the way that you've said it's fun and rewarding. Um, in your field of, I mean, in your work around studying companies, what would you say is the difference between the companies where agile transcends leadership change um, and those where it vanishes when the ambassador also moves on? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking it. Because I think some companies build their management system around the people. That is, we we find one or two or three stars and we figure out how to leverage those people. And that's fine for a while, although it's not easy to reproduce. (laughs) And if those people leave, you're likely to lose that capability. And we've seen lots of companies where the leadership team turns over and suddenly it stops becoming the performer that it is that it was before. I think the trick is to create a sustainable system that lets typical executives, typical employees succeed. And when companies do that, we actually see the opposite. And sometimes employees don't realize that, to tell you the truth. Sometimes we see companies where the system is so good that the executives start to believe it's me. Uh, I'm a genius. And we watch them leave that system and go to another company and they fail. Sometimes they fail miserably. We see this in sports as well, by the way. You'll see somebody who's a star on one team and then they go to another team or a coach who's a star in one team and, and suddenly they're not. What is it? Well, it's the system. And so that's one of the major things that we're trying to do in Agile is not build it around individual personalities, but to create a sustainable system that will outlive any people and that will make the people while they're there better than they would be separately in any other place. So I I think that's the key. It's, It's the system rather than the individuals. Maybe that's the problem with our quarterback in Philadelphia then. That, uh, we, that... <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't talk to me about that. I lost Tom Brady last I year. <laughs> so bad for you. Let's go to Larry. Larry, you have a question for Daryl. My, my question, uh, agile systems involve the customer focus in a, a lot of places. 
And how do you make certain that you're talking to the right people when you reach out to the customer? Oh, what a wonderful question. Because I, I think too many times people talk to current customers and sometimes even their best customers as opposed to their non-customers or their disgruntled customers. And that's where you learn the most. So I think it's important when we're working with Agile teams, we will often set up online communities so that they can talk to their customers on a very frequent basis. And even in a remote setting, uh, you can reach out and say, hey, we're, we're playing around with this. What do you think of this advertisement, for example? Or what do you think of the look of this uh, branding or whatever it might be. And we like to divide them up into segments of what kinds of customers are they? And are they past customers? Are they current customers? Are they lead users? Are they laggards? And I think it's important to talk to a variety of customers, but the more unsatisfied they are, the, the greater fear they have of trying your, your products or services, the more likely you are to learn something valuable from those people. Because we've seen a lot of companies, retail is famous for doing this, by the way, who will use customer satisfaction surveys to track how they're doing. And the first question in the satisfaction survey is, have you shopped with us in the last three months or six months? And if they haven't, then they terminate the survey because they don't want to waste time talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about them. But as a result, you see the number of customers plummeting while the satisfaction scores get higher and higher because the only people that are left to talk about are the people that still think you're great and the rest of the people, they're gone. <laughs> you're never going to talk to them. So uh, it's a great question, but I, I would say, first of all, talk to future customers or potential customers, the ones that you figure you're really going to have to win with long term in order to be able to succeed and not often current customers. You often talk about experiences, uh, collecting customer experiences as well in the book. Can you illuminate that just a bit about the process of collecting that? Yes. And, and by experiences, what we really mean is not just the product or the service that they're consuming at the time, but everything that led up to them discovering the product? Was it hard for them to find? Was it easy for them to find? How did they shop around? Was it easy to compare and appreciate what the benefits were? And then when they bought it, and then when they received it, and if they had to return it, or if they had a problem with the service, we really need to understand that, that entire end-to-end -end customer experience. And then we look at the hot spots, the places that are burning, that customers are having problems on, and then we'll try to prioritize that and say, okay, how do we fix this? And now how do we put it back into the flow of the customer experience and make sure that it works well? So I do a lot of work in retail, for example, and I, I once, one of my daughters had an experience at a very large, very successful retailer where she wanted to buy a toy for one of her kids for Christmas. And she saw it online for a good price. And, but she wasn't sure it would get there in time. So she went to the store to try to pick it up so she would have it in time. Well, when she got to the store, it was, it cost more than 25% more in the store than it did online. And so she went to the cash register and said, well, can I have the online price for this? And they said, well, no, that's online. This is the store. She said, but I can buy it online and pick it up in store, right? Yes, you could do that. Uh, you'll have to wait five days uh, to pick it up in the store. But yes, you could do that. Why? It's on the shelf over there right now. Well, long story short, this is not looking at the customer's end to end experience. This is them saying, look, we got an online business. We got a store business. You are not my problem. 
Well, of course it is. We've got to figure out how to create a great customer experience, no matter what channel they're using, where they are in that process, everybody in the organization has to be geared towards solving that customer experience. Let's go to Ryan. Ryan, you have a question for Daryl. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so Daryl, my, my question is, what advice would you give for employees who see the value in this and want to build a business case to, to bring it to management? Um, especially, and I was thinking of a comment you made earlier when this kind of creates that shift from a boss-centric organization to more of a customer-centric organization. Well, life is a whole lot easier if you can get a senior executive sponsor who's willing to stand up for you. Um, and that would be my first preference. If I could find somebody in senior management who would be willing to give me a shot, I would love to work with somebody like that. Because as you know, in an agile team, you're going to have to get cross-functional, multidisciplinary experts working on the same team. If it's all within one department, that's relatively easy. So if you think you're going to do a software development uh, project, for example, and you can put all the design engineers and the coders and the customer experience interface, if you can do all of that within a department, that's very easy. But if I need somebody from operations and somebody from marketing and somebody from stores to come from their current silo to work with me, I'm going to need some support from a senior executive, from human resources people to help me get those people, especially if I, as I prefer, if I want to get those people full time working on my team. So my first suggestion would be, if I possibly can, let me get a senior executive to do this. And if not, I'm still going to give it a go, frankly, because sometimes persuading senior executives can be harder in a theoretical debate than it can be to show them that it works and have them say, that's amazing. How did you do that? Well, let me explain it. Um, and so if I can, I'll get support. If not, I'm going to do my best with my team, with whatever I can to try to create an agile team environment around me. And one of the most interesting things to me is we have something called the Bain Agility Quotient, where we'll go in and survey organizations and try to find how are the different teams in different parts of the organization working. And are they happy? Are they successful? What results are they producing? And what patterns do we see for successful teams versus unsuccessful teams? And it's just fascinating to me to see that within the same company, often within the same department, we'll have teams that are extraordinarily happy and successful and other teams that are not. And you say, why? What, what is the difference? And often it's a product owner or it's a composition of the team that uh, just clicks that I think often the, the lessons across the company are at least as interesting and at least as insightful. Everybody always wants to benchmark themselves against Netflix and Amazon, and that's fine. But frankly, you're not going to learn as much from that. We've got the benchmarks. That's great. But you're not going to learn as much from that as you are from people within the same company that you can talk to and say, how did you pull that off? That's a remarkable achievement. Rebecca, you have a question for Daryl. Yes, thank you. So just from observations, um, it seems like many of us were forced into an agile work <laughs> setting or agile teams very unknowingly at the start of this pandemic. And from reading the book, I only now understand that my team has actually adapted to this style Again, unknowingly, I feel like so many of us. So would you agree due to our new virtual world that more teams will be moving into or at least trying out an agile structure? I would say yes, with a caveat, um, because you know I've had conversations over the past year with senior executives at more than a hundred companies. And 
what I'm finding is that they're, they're at a very critical point in their agile journeys. Because on the one hand, yes, they're appreciating the potential value of agile. They find themselves making decisions faster. They find themselves having to trust and empower more autonomous teams. And so th there are a lot of things that by nature, just you know, necessity being the mother of invention, they've had to try agile. On the other hand, uh, we're seeing a couple of things. One is pockets of success, but innovation still being too sporadic and haphazard. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And frequently what we're seeing is customers whose satisfaction levels have actually dropped during this pandemic. So on the one hand, like internet commerce, for example, it's booming, it's up 20, 30%, it's booming, but customers are less satisfied than they were at the start of the pandemic, often by four percentage points. And so while executives are patting themselves on the back and saying, look how fast we're moving, customers are saying, yeah, not fast enough. And when people are monitoring social media like Glassdoor and reading what employees are saying about their current work environment, we're seeing significant increases in comments about, we still got way too much red tape. We're moving too slowly. And so the biggest question that a lot of executives are coming to me with right now are executives that are saying, we see some good, we're a little afraid that when this pandemic passes, people are just like a rubber band going to snap back to the old ways of behaving. How do we keep the good parts of this? How do we bottle up the good parts, make sure that we keep it and continuing to improve? Because you keep saying if people aren't happy with Agile, then we're not doing it right. And I can tell you, we're burning out our people. They are, they cannot keep up this pace. So how do we figure out a way to make this more sustainable? So I'm, I think it's a good news, bad news thing. And I, I think another piece of good news is that working in distributed teams, remote Agile teams, it's worked better than we feared. I, I would say they're probably 80 to 85% as productive as if we could be together face to face, which isn't great, but most other teams not working in Agile are probably 50 to 60% as productive. There's something about the Agile schedules, the, the rigorous process of we're gonna have a daily stand up, we're gonna have a uh, sprint review every two weeks. We're going to use planning software tools to make our work visible. They're more successful than most other teams, and we have a lot of parts of the organization that are turning to them. But we're also learning, hey, you know, we've got access to, particularly in technology, for example, we didn't ever think we could attract people to work in this particular city or this particular state, but online, they don't care where we are. So we're expanding the, the talent pool, I think, for a lot of companies and a lot of teams as well. Uh, I want to offer uh, Jean an opportunity to jump in. So she has a practical question on the, the Bain agility quotient. So Jean, just go ahead with your inquiry. Sure. Hi, Daryl. Thank you so much. Um, so following up on the reference you made to the Bain quotient, um, the agility, the Bain agility quotient. I was wondering, I understand it's 12 questions. Is, would it be reasonable for say us to try to assess our organization with those 12 questions to help us understand the feasibility to implement agile within our organization? Is that something that you would think we could do on our own or how do you see that working? So a couple of things. I, first of all, we have a lot of variations of the agility quotient. The simplest that we kind of put online just to give people a sense of what the questions are and how they work uh, is that, is 12 questions. But the standard one that we use is about 70 questions. And they're quick. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to fill it out. But 
if I had my preference, I would have somebody do the 70 question survey. And more importantly, I would have that followed up with personal interviews to talk to people about why they said what they said, what they really meant when they were talking about this. But uh, yeah, it's something that we give to clients and they can do it as frequently as they want to do it. Often it's every quarter or every six months because again, mostly what they're trying to see is, are we reducing the variation among teams and are we generally getting better? So at first, the scores are often pretty bad and executives feel pretty bad about that. And I'm saying, wait, 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 wait. This just gives you a great base to keep coming back and saying, look at the progress that we're making. Don't worry, don't worry about where you're starting. We have an honest assessment of what's going on. Now we know how to fix it. But we prefer to have clients doing it for themselves uh, over time, actually. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. John, let's, uh, let's get your question to John Connors. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, it's really interesting you talked about bringing together cross-disciplinary teams um, in organizations that might be siloed. How do, what can leaders do kind of at the onset of you know, implementing Agile and make sure that they can bring the teams together successfully or you know, really try to set themselves up for success? So silos are complicated. <laughs> um, you know, I think the truth is, uh, much as we like to criticize silos, the truth is we're always going to need some sort of silos if you believe that we need some division of labor, as I do. And you can't, it, it's not easy anyway to have one team follow a customer everywhere doing everything for them. If you think about getting on to a, let's say you want to book a trip from San Francisco to Boston. And what we want is a team that is going to take care of that entire customer experience in a seamless, no silo way. Okay, so we're gonna have a team that's going to do what? Advertise that you can buy a ticket from us, design everything to enable the customer to buy the ticket. You're gonna follow the customer to the airport, check them in. You're gonna put their baggage on the plane. You're going to help them get their get checked in at the gate. You're gonna help them with their bags on the plane. You're gonna fly the plane. To, you just can't possibly do that. You need some division of labor. And the question is, how am I going to divide labor in the way that is most productive? And often that ends up, in fact, one of the things that you find is that 80% of the people in an organization are gonna be working in fairly traditional ways. They're not going to be working on an agile team day in and day out. And that's okay. What we need is when people are doing innovation, they do have to look at that entire customer experience and they have to break it down and figure out how to improve it. But we're looking end to end to design the solution to the customer problem. But then once we design that, then we have to translate it into operations so that operations can actually do that in a way that is consistent with the original design. So I've seen people that try to break functional and product line silos apart and turn those into agile silos, squads, tribes, chapters, guilds. We have a whole new organization structure. And the only difference is that it is now structured around shiny new silos called agile teams. But now I've got agile teams that have different parts of the experience. I've still got to stitch it together. So I think the trick actually in agile is figuring out how to combine the best, how do, you, how do you harmonize those operating silos with the innovation teams? 
you're never going to be able to completely break those apart. What you're going to do is pull people out of all of those silos when you're designing an innovation uh, product or, or solution, bring them together and design it, and then figure out how to get it done in the rest of the organization. Yeah. So that's a nice follow on to uh, uh, Surish's question. Surish, I'd like to invite you in to ask your question of Daryl. Yeah, so my question was, what are the core competencies of an agile executive leadership? Um, so, you know, the chief marketing officer, CTO, et cetera. And what are the biggest problems that traditional companies have faced as they, you know, maybe they really do want to make that transition, but what are the challenges that they might face? Good. So let's see, I've been doing consulting for 43 years now. I have sat through, I don't know, thousands of executive committee meetings and board meetings. And most of the meetings that I sit through of executive committees are groups of, of functional leaders who all believe that their primary responsibility is to run their function their division, their business, so that they meet their OKRs or whatever the, the objectives and the key results are. And it's kind of Adam Smith's philosophy of if I maximize my own wealth, then collectively this will add up to a, a healthy and wealthy company. But it doesn't. And what happens is you sit in those meetings and each of those functional leaders is trying to figure out how to maximize their own efforts, to maximize their own bonuses, to, but they're, they're trying to do what's best for their individual department. And the thought of giving up five valuable resources to go work on something that is great for the company, but a little tough for their individual function, that's a challenge. It is real different to watch an executive team who is a team as opposed to a group of experts, to watch a team of executives acting like an agile leadership team instead of an executive committee. Because what they do is, I get it, my job is a job of innovation as well. My job is to build an innovation system. That's an innovation. I'm going to build an innovation system that will let hundreds or thousands of agile teams unleash the productivity of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. That's my job. And so the CEO, like on any agile team, the CEO is probably the product owner of that team. And the chief marketing officer is going to be the person that is trying to build this obsession with customers. How do we create more rapid feedback loops? How do we talk to non-customers as well as current customers? And the chief financial officer typically is going to be improving the planning and the budgeting processes so that they don't happen on an annual basis, which is a crazy idea by the way, when I talk to executives about how they do their strategic planning and their budgeting processes and their reviewing processes, almost always it's on an annual basis. And you say, why do you do this once a year? And of course, you know the answer to that. It's obvious because that's how long it takes the earth to orbit the sun. So, of course, we should do our strategic planning and budgeting process based on how long it takes the Earth to orbit the sun. You know, thank heavens we don't live on Neptune. You'd, you only get a bonus every 170 years. You know, I'd, I'd rather live on Mercury where this is happening once a quarter. And so the, the chief financial officer is typically the one that is changing those kinds of systems. And the chief human resources officer is the person that is trying to figure out how do I get people out of silos 
and dedicated to a team? How do I reward them? How, what does their career path look like if they're going to go into Agile? And the chief information officer is developing all of the technologies that is going to enable these teams to work as quickly as they need to. And the chief operating officer is trying to figure out how do I harmonize my operating people with the agile teams to make this work. So each of them plays an expert role, but each of them is contributing to a team effort to create this business system that will live long past any executive and that will get past the selfish interests of any individual part of the business to create something that, that makes the company as a whole worth more than its parts. Great question. Great, great, good answers. Thank you. We have a couple of people who want to jump in with some follow-up to things that have already been said, but I know Wayne Tarkin has a, a question. Let's squeeze Wayne in before we go back to Juliet and Ryan. Now, my, my focus is more on a tactical level. You know, there's, there's certain management infrastructures inside organizations, budgeting, planning, performance management that really inhibit an, an agile uh, mindset or a practice. You know, we focus on job descriptions and we don't really focus on capabilities. Do you have any kind of examples, uh, without naming the names, of organizations that are really kind of have, have uh, looked at performance management in an agile way and really improved it? And what were some of the lessons learned there? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one um, uh, one very successful retailer uh, that we do some work with, we actually started our agile work in the human resources department. A lot of people don't think of that as a natural place to start, but that's where it started. And they were very interested in looking out into the future and saying, what kind of talent are we going to need? How do we attract that talent here? How do we build a sufficient pool of people to get ready for the future? And it led to some very interesting work where we started looking, for example, at the current workforce, where were the bottlenecks, where were things getting held up, and we found where the constraints were, that people were working on five or six things at the same time, and they were bottlenecking the rest of the operations. We found some places where we had, frankly, excess resources, and we said, we don't need that many of this kind of people in the future. So let's either talk about how we retrain them and, and get them to be capable of doing things that we are going to need or encourage them to be looking for something else to do. So if I could pick a couple of partners to get started with on an effort like this, certainly the chief human resources officer would be right near the top of my list. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to ask, uh, invite Susan uh, into the conversation. Susan has uh, got a question on scaling, which is relevant to the reading that we've done to this point in the book. So Susan, go ahead with your question, and then we'll go back to Juliet and uh, Ryan. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's actually a two-part question. One, I was wondering if you can just kind of discuss scaling Agile. Um, I think that would be pretty interesting um, to kind of get your perspective on that and its adoption around so many different companies around the world. Um, and then taking it to even a more advanced level is um, your experience with finance. And have you seen any finance organizations actually embracing Agile practices and what they do and how they do it and how they invest in the organization, fund things, as as well as um, technology business management and kind of being that translator between the business and technology. So I know that's a whole uh, <laughs> a bunch of topics, um, but maybe if you could touch upon some of those would be great. Sure, uh, both great questions, uh, both difficult questions, but I'll, I'll try to hurry through them a little bit. First of all, on scaling Agile. Um, don't scale Agile too fast. The, we typically will, when we're working with clients, we'll take them through three stages. The first is agile teams. We want to make sure that we understand how to make agile teams hum before we scale it. Because if you scale bad agile, you get terrible agile. It is, it is really unfortunate. So the first phase that we'll go through, and we'll do this with somewhere between 25 and 50 teams 
to make sure that they become beacons of inspiration for the rest of the organization, that the rest of the organization says, that's how I want to work. I want to create those kinds of results. I want to have the kind of fun that those people are having. I want to work with agile teams. And once we've got that pretty much figured out, then we go to the second stage, which is what we call scaling agile or agile at scale. And agile at scale means two things. Number one, it means we can do any innovation project that we want to in agile ways. So maybe we started this in technology, that's all right. We know how to do it in marketing. We know how to do it in our supply chain. We need know how to do it in our operations. We know how to do it in human resources. We can do it anywhere we want to do an agile team. The second thing that it means is I can do even very large programs with agile teams. So the example I often use is Saab Aeronautics. Saab Aeronautics is building fighter jets. It takes five years and about a hundred teams to build a fighter jet. But Saab Aeronautics knows how to get a hundred teams coordinating with each other. And that's no mean feat to make sure that you know how to, we call it a taxonomy of teams, but to figure out how do I divide the teams up? How do I get them coordinated with the people that are dependent on what they do here in order for me to get going there? So that's the second stage is we get to agile at scale. And then the third stage, which is never ending, is an agile enterprise where you say, okay, I can do large programs, but this operating model, how we do planning and funding and how we change our culture and how we achieve our purpose, those things all have to keep changing forever. So how do I run the business efficiently, change the business effectively, harmonize those operations, keep finding constraint after constraint after constraint, eliminate it so that we get better and faster every day. That's what I mean by scaling agile or getting to an agile enterprise. Finance organizations. Finance organizations can be wonderful enablers. I'm working with a company right now where the chief financial officer is probably the primary driver of agile in the organization. And they're doing a couple of things in finance. One is improving their own operations. They're using agile teams to look at the reports. Uh, do we need all of these things? Are people using them? Are they helpful? Who are our customers? My customers are internal, but am I helping them? The second thing that they're doing is redesigning the planning and budgeting processes to do two things. One is actually separate planning and forecasting from budgeting because a lot of times those things get tied and it keeps people from pursuing bold enough objectives. And the second thing is just this past uh, January actually, they moved from doing annual planning and budgeting to quarterly planning and budgeting. And that may not sound like a big deal, but that is a big deal. They are determined that they're going to fund projects like a venture capitalist would fund projects. And so in the past, what has happened is that a business or a function will come to them and say, we've got this project in mind, we need a hundred million dollars in order to do it. And they approve it after a long drawn out process, but they approve $100 million and then basically back up the Brinks truck, unload $100 million and say, okay, here's your funding. We know it's going to take five years. Go get them. Well, they're not doing that anymore. What they're doing is to say, we like this $100 million idea but let's look at the hypotheses behind this idea and let's ask ourselves, what are those hypotheses? How could we test them? And based on what we learn, how could that change what we're going to do? And so they're starting by saying, we're going to give you seed capital of a million dollars to test this basic hypothesis. Come back to us if we like that we may give you $5 million. If we don't, we're gonna to have to change things. But they're 
they're funding business ideas just like any good venture capitalist would do it, which is pretty interesting, actually, mm -hmm. and is leading to much faster reallocation of resources. And for things that are working, when they find something that they've got a lot of confidence in, really pouring money into this so that it grows three to four times faster than ever before. We've got a couple of folks who want to jump back in with some follow up. So Juliet, you're first. Go ahead. Brigitte, did you want to take your question first? Only because so it's time to Yeah. Because I really liked your question. Thanks, Juliet. It actually, I think it's a natural segue. Um, Daryl, I would be very curious to know how Bain feels about and has adopted Agile and Agile teams and processes within Bain and your perspective on how relevant it is, I was gonna to say to management consulting, but truthfully to B2B and service oriented organizations. I, I love that question, um, partially because it allows me to brag. Uh, <laughs> and I will say often when I'm talking about agile executives, I talk about we rather than they, because I consider myself an ex a senior executive. I've been at Bain for 43 years and we have to do budgets and we have to build new products and services as well. And uh, some of my earliest work in Agile was training Bain teams how to work in Agile ways with uh, developing like our IT department. We taught them how to do Agile and they just, reinvented our knowledge system, what we call our global experience system, using agile tools to do that. But just as importantly, we taught, we teach all of our incoming associate consultants and consultants how to use agile in uh, tackling their own consulting projects and to help clients to do that, which I think makes us much better, much more empathetic with our uh, clients. And we're fortunate, if you look at this, that Bain uh, is often rated as either the number one or number two place to work uh, in the world. <laughs> and, you know, I joined Bain when Bain had about 50 people. I would never have dreamed in a million years that Bain would be compared to Google or Microsoft or Amazon as one of the leading places to work. I, I would, it's mind boggling to me to even imagine that, but uh, you know, we believe it, we practice it and I think it's helping us and it certainly makes our people happier. It's a, you know, for me, um, I don't mean to personalize this too much, but when you're a senior consultant, when you're a senior partner, a lot of teams come to you and they say, Daryl, we're in a pickle. What do you think we should do? And for many decades, I'd say, ah, yes, young cricket. You know, I've seen this problem. I don't know how many. Here's what you do. You go do this. You go do that. Yes, sir. And it doesn't work. And they say, not my problem. I, you know, I just did what Daryl told me to do. And I don't do that anymore. I, I say, what do you recommend that we do? And at first they're caught off guard, no longer. They know if you go to Daryl, he's gonna say, well, what do you recommend? But what do you recommend that we do? And they tell me, and I say, that's a very interesting hypothesis. How could we test that? And then we talk about how to test that. And then I say, what do you need from me? And so it's a very different process of, being the owner of all the answers to my job is to, you know, I, I learned this lesson as a parent. I've got three married children, eight grandchildren. I remember when I was a new parent, I thought my job was to raise obedient children. And if I did that, if they stayed out of trouble, then I was a success. And then when my kids became teenagers and I realized they were gonna soon be leaving the house, I said, oh my goodness. That's not my job. My job is to raise future parents, future adults who are going to be citizens of the world, who make the world a better place, who will be a, a better person than I am. And it really changed my outlook on what the role of a manager, what the role of a parent, what, what the role of a friend should be. Great. 
So we do have some a couple of more questions. I hope you can hang on for just a bit. We're almost at an hour, but we got some really good questions here. I would like to invite Juliet, Ryan, and then uh, Bianca has a, also a question. So Juliet, you're first. Thank you. Um, as a part of my research, I've been interviewing software developers, project managers, and tech executives at large Silicon Valley-based um, software development organizations. And I asked them questions about um, what they think is blocking innovation um, in their highly functioning environments. And I often hear people complain about their promotion and incentive structures either favoring disruptive innovation rather than projects that are maybe a little bit more centered around customer needs uh, that may be more incremental but might not end in a promotion um, and don't always reward cross-functionality. I was wondering, as you've worked with, reimagine incentive and promotion structures in a way that better encourages agile values and innovation. Terrific. So uh, let me say two things. First of all, with all due respect to Silicon Valley, I get a little tired of people who point to Silicon Valley as the font of all wisdom and knowledge. There are a lot of great companies that come out of Silicon Valley, and there are a lot that fail, a lot that fail. And so I... When I talk about Agile, I talk about Agile as the balance between running the business efficiently and changing the business effectively. It's a balance. And most large companies fall out of balance by over-focusing on operations and not focusing enough on innovation. They run their innovation like it's an assembly line and it doesn't work. Most young companies have the opposite problem. They're really good at innovation. They're not good at operations. They're not good at systematizing the things that they're learning. And you read about all sorts of Silicon Valley uh, companies that need to bring in more professional managers over time to help them figure out how to scale. And so uh, when I talk about balance, often companies are coming at it from different directions it doesn't much matter, but the trick is you've got to find out what your weakness is. Where are you out of balance and how do I fix that? And the biggest problem, so we all know 70 to 90% of business innovations fail. 70 to 90% of business innovations fail. Why do they fail? Typically one or two reasons. One is they build the wrong things. They build what they think is cool, but no customer really wants it. Not, they can't do it profitably. They can give it away, but they can't do it profitably. Or number two, they build something that cannot be reproduced, that, can, that cannot run efficiently, and therefore operations looks at it and says, you know, this is a clever idea. I just can't happen to make it. I, I just can't make this profitable. So in those kinds of situations, it's one of the reasons that we don't believe. A lot of people talk about skunk works. Let's take it out of the operate. I do not believe in skunk works. There, that is a, most of the time, an extraordinary waste of time and energy because it builds the wrong thing and what they build operations can't do. So I believe you want these agile teams working with operations side by side and you've got to reward both of them for the jobs that they do. They both have to feel like they've got noble missions and they both have to appreciate each other. Ryan, your question. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so so Daryl, my question is, um, say you're on a leadership team in the organization's getting ready to try and scale agile really before they even go in and pilot um, pilot it with some teams. How do you how do you recommend we like kind of pump the brakes and go back and revisit um, guiding principles to make sure that we're really truly allowing the the teams to to be agile in the right way? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of that depends on your role in the organization because 
if you're senior enough, I think it's relatively easy to say, look, if we want to become an agile organization, let's use agile to become agile. Let's test it. Let's prove it. Let's learn some things, figure out what we can change in the process to do it. I will tell you, I spend an enormous part of my time right now undoing bad agile because senior executives get convinced by some zealot consultant that they can have an agile organization in a year if they'll just go in, restructure the organization, reorganize, get rid of these people, get rid of those people. It sounds so simple. It sounds so easy. And it turns out so badly. So, you know, I, I can point to those kinds of examples that have not gone very well. It's not easy to do publicly because they don't like to admit it publicly. A lot of these people made big splashes in the beginning talking about how agile they were and they got lots of positive PR and now it's fallen apart and they're not gonna go back out and say, oops, uh, you know, Mulligan, we'll, we'll restart this one. But the truth of the matter is I would not do a big bang approach ever. I would say if we believe in agile, if we really believe in agile as a lifestyle, as a way of working, shouldn't we be using agile approaches to create an agile enterprise? It's ironic actually that anybody would say, yeah, let's, let's use even more bureaucracy to get rid of bureaucracy. It's a silly approach. Bianca, you have a question? I do. Hey, guys. Hey, Daryl. Great to see you. Um, I do have a question. So an agile work environment has characteristics that you mentioned here, flexibility, transparency. There's a simple nature to it. They're collaborative. You also need employees that can thrive with an agile mindset in those agile environments. How do you develop and hire employees that can be successful in that environment? Yeah, I get this question a lot. And, uh, you know, a lot of executives will say, we can't possibly do this because we don't have the right employees. And to some extent, it takes me back to the question that, uh, that we were talking about earlier of what happened in the pandemic. Well, something interesting happened. We got better at doing innovation with the same employees that we had before with the same organization structure that we had before, they were capable of doing it. We just didn't know it. So if I'm being frank with you, the, the biggest bottleneck, the biggest challenge is almost never the talent inside the organization. It's the management team's willingness to give them the opportunities that they need in order to be agile. And so I have a lot of executives that will say, Daryl, you're telling me that I should just blindly trust these, these employees who have never had this kind of responsibility before. And I'm saying, no, you shouldn't blindly trust anybody. That's not your job. That's a dereliction of duty. But your job is to build trustworthy employees. That's your job so that when you give them that responsibility, they're ready for it. Give them a chance. It's, you know, it's the same with my kids. I didn't, when they got their driver's license, I didn't let them take the car cross country immediately, but you, you let them take the car longer, a little farther, you develop trust, their behaving responsibility, they get more and more and more. What Bain finds is that the average employee is capable of doing 40% more than they're asked to do, 40% greater productivity. And they want to do it. They're eager to do it. In fact, a lot of people leave to go do it because they don't feel like they're learning and growing fast enough. That's the major reason that people leave. Hmm. I think that our job as leaders is to figure out how to unleash that 40% of untapped potential. So we have one more question to end the, the, our discussion. It's coming from Wayne. No, I think I asked my question, Steve, already. Oh, what, what about the one on measurement? Uh, yeah, Daryl, I know we had talked about it briefly on uh, 
uh, on Monday when we talked, you know, the whole idea of measuring agile and, and um, you know, what's measuring, what, what gets measured gets done. And so are there any kind of uh, uh, metrics you've used to see how an agile program is going? Any, any uh, use cases or lessons learned from companies who really got it right? Um, because obviously, you know, yet qualitatively, you can say it's going to work and test it. But if you have some data behind it to show that it has worked, um, that's uh, more helpful to kind of, uh, you know, get permission to keep going with it. Kind of curious your thoughts. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. One is, um, yes, Agile is based on empiricism. Agile is based on data. I often can, I often compare agile teams to autonomous vehicles that if if agile teams are working well we're constantly getting feedback we're adjusting quickly and it doesn't feel like we're making these abrupt sharp turns it just feels smooth because we're making continuous improvements based on feedback that we're getting from customers for employees um, that just enable us to, to change. And so we measure a bunch of things. We measure whether we're accomplishing our purpose and whether the outcomes, the results are good and whether people are performing their activities properly and whether we have the right inputs. But another thing about metrics changes in Agile, which is we, we place more emphasis on teams and even businesses than before. And, and if you go back and understand bureaucracy and how it came about, it essentially came about following the second industrial revolution when there was an assumption that people were kind of lazy and that it, unless you oversaw everything that they did minute by minute, they were going to slack off and not, and, and that if you measured a team, there would just be people that coasted and didn't do anything and, and didn't carry their load. And in Agile, we're more likely to try to shift rewards towards the entire team, but we're likely to give the team more voice on the people that they want to work with. And so if there are people on the team that nobody wants to work with, the team has the ability to say, sorry, that they're just too contentious. They're not carrying their share of the load. They're not contributing anything. So there will be more team rewards, but the team will have a much greater voice in it as opposed to a boss that says, you have to work with so-and-so. You know, one of the things I, I must say I never liked when I was in your position were team projects where some of the team members were not going to carry their share of the load. They knew full well that Daryl was going to do more than his share to make sure that the team didn't fail. Um, and we didn't have any voice into whether we wanted to vote somebody off of the island or not. You know, in Agile teams, there's a lot of feedback that goes back to people. Um, and I, I like that approach. It's more team-based, but more team uh, giving 360 degree feedback also. Well, Darrell, we've come to the end of our hour with you. It's been a fascinating conversation. I want thank to you. thank you so much for giving us your time tonight, especially for writing the book so that uh, our course is far better because we have your book and your wisdom throughout of it. And uh, we're looking forward to delving into other aspects of the book and learning from it. And we welcome you back at any time if you'd like to drop in to see us, we'd uh, love to have you along. So thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to Daryl. <laughs> and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. thank you. So nice to meet all of you. I hope we can stay in touch. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye. All right. We're going to take a break, I think. Yes, thank you, everybody. I hope that was um, a really good, uh, an ex you know, a, a fortuitous experience for us that he was available and he was willing, ready, and able to do that. So thank you, Wayne for uh, teeing that up and for uh, wrestling that to the realization here. I think it was a great uh, way to get us into the uh, acts of Agile very early on in our discussion and our experience of it. So we're going to take a break for about 10 minutes and uh, then come back and then uh, we will go into our block two for the evening, which is uh, a discussion around some breakout questions. If you don't have those 
breakout questions in front of you. They are posted in the announcement section of the Canvas site. So pull them down from there and you'll be assigned to a breakout when and, we get And there. thank you to Allison and Susan and the other corporate leaders for participation. Yeah. You guys have been really helpful in terms of developing this course in mindset. And so I appreciate your participation. And we hope to see you along the way. Thank yeah, you so much. We will. All right. We'll see the rest of you in 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Stop recording. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah.